My message is the gospel of the kingdom. I say it's the gospel of the kingdom. It's not the gospel of an institution, it's the gospel of a kingdom. It's not the gospel of an idea, it's the gospel of the kingdom. We're hearing a lot these days about a coming kingdom and the future reign of Jesus. Now I'm here to announce an existing kingdom. One that's functioning to the glory of God. A kingdom that's associated with the gospel of Christ. Mark begins his gospel by saying these words. The beginning of the gospel of Christ. Then he makes a beeline to John the Baptist and said, he was telling people, the kingdom of God is near. So the kingdom of God is connected with the gospel of Christ. Not a future gospel, the gospel that we have now. John the Baptist preached the kingdom of God is near at hand. Be alert. It's at hand. Amen. Jesus came preaching and he did the same thing. He preached the kingdom of God is near. Repent. Get sin out of your life. Change what you're doing. You know, John the Baptist taught this. Jesus taught it. Paul taught it. You got to shape your life up externally before you come to Jesus. I mean, if you're a drunk, you got to quit being a drunk before you come to Jesus. Amen. Bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. I mean, sir, you're a thief, you got to quit stealing first. Amen. Don't even knock on a door till you've done it. Then when you do it, then he'll help you keep. <laughs> He'll help you keep doing it, but you've got to prove you mean business by stopping doing what you shouldn't be doing. Stop it. Tonight. Stop it. Nobody in heaven's going to believe you're serious unless you do. And you'll find out that that kicks heaven into gear to be with you. When Philip came preaching, Philip the deacon used the office of a deacon well and became an evangelist. It says of him, he went down to Samaria and he, they believed Philip, they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God. This is some years after Pentecost. Preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus. See, there it is again, the kingdom connected with Jesus. And Paul, <laughs> he preached the kingdom. He met with the elders of Ephesus, and he said this to him, Acts 20, 25, Behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God. That's what he preached to those people. He wrapped up his ministry in Acts 28 when he was already in Rome as a prisoner. And it said he was preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. I see I've substantiated to you that the preaching of the kingdom of God and preaching Christ go together. Nobody's preached Christ right till they preach the kingdom of God. This is a real kingdom with a real king. Not a figurative one. Jesus, when he is, he said a lot about the kingdom of God in his preaching. He said, Seek ye first, what was it? The kingdom of God. He wasn't talking about some kingdom going to happen up in the future sometime. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's your dual pursuit. Again, he said, Matthew 12, 28, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, 
then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Again, he said, Matthew 21, 31, whither of them twain did the will of his father, they said unto him, the first faithful son, Jesus said unto them, verily I say unto you that the publicans and harlots will get into the kingdom of God before you. Mark 1, 15, he said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Well, I tell you, it's, it's good stuff. Joseph of Arimathea said of him, Mark 15, 43, he was waiting for the kingdom of God. Amen. Now, Paul, he had a lot to say about the kingdom of God. He mentions the, that the Ephesians, that he preached the kingdom of God there. Matthew, Acts 19, 8 says he preached the kingdom of God in the synagogues. And Acts 28, I mentioned to you, said he preached the kingdom of God. In his epistles 18 times, he mentions the kingdom of God. One time he mentions the kingdom of Christ and of God. Another time he mentions the kingdom of his dear son, into which we've been translated. James referred to the kingdom which he has promised to them that love him. The kingdom is mentioned two times in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Timothy, the heavenly kingdom, one time in 2 Timothy 4.18, thy kingdom, in Hebrews 1.8, you know, thy kingdom is the scepter of righteousness, is the scepter of thy kingdom, he said to the Son. And the everlasting kingdom, Peter talked about the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we read about the kingdom at least one time. So how is it more is not said about the kingdom? I'd like to know. We deserve some explanations why people aren't preaching about this. John the Baptist preached about it. Jesus preached about it. Paul preached about it. James preached about it. Peter preached about it. How dare someone tell us there's a future kingdom? We're looking for Jesus to come to earth to reign. Well, see, this just isn't true. I could have some very derogatory statements to make, but I am going to be merciful tonight. Jesus went to heaven to reign. He's not coming back to reign. Now, Peter preached this very pretty specifically on the day of Pentecost. He declared that Jesus was right now uh, sitting on David's throne. Amen. And David's throne's not in Jerusalem. I'm sorry. If you believe that, just like unbelieve it. It's Amen. not true. Amen. Here's what Peter said. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you about the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried in his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. That's what we're talking about here. Jesus sitting on David's throne. Seeing this before, he spake of the resurrection of Christ. Not the second coming. Not the second coming. He spoke of the resurrection of Christ. His soul was not left in Hades, neither his flesh to see corruption. And Jesus has raised God up. Uh, God has raised Jesus up. Wherever we're all witnesses. And he said, by the right hand of God exalted, having received the promise of the Father. That's the promise set on David's throne. The promise of the Holy Spirit. He has shed forth this, which you now see in here. What's going on here on the day of Pentecost? Jesus is doing that. This is one of his first kingly acts. He did something that folk fight against. They'll be fighting back in the 20th century. They'll be fighting about this. He poured out his spirit on, uh, be careful now, on the maidens. On the maidens. We don't believe that here. Who cares what you believe? What difference does that make? Poured out his spirit on the handmaidens, on the sons and the daughters. And he told them that's what was going on on the day of Pentecost. This is that. King, that was a kingdom. He, was, he launched the kingdom. 
we're going to be a kingdom use people that he didn't normally use before. David's not ascending to heaven, he said. So he wasn't talking about himself. The Lord, he said, said unto my Lord, as God said to his Lord, who he foresaw as his seed, sit thou on my right hand until I make your foes your footstool. Now he's not sitting there idle. He's sitting there in kingly activity. The gospel of the kingdom. That phrase is mentioned, the gospel of the kingdom, is mentioned a number of times, about four or five times. The gospel of the kingdom. The good news of the kingdom. A kingdom is in force right, uh, right now. What, what do we mean when we say the kingdom of God? Like, what are, what are we saying? Well, first of all, understand that God's never been without a kingdom. His kingdom's an everlasting kingdom. Old Nebuchadnezzar, after his seminary training, he knew that. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. So God's never been without a kingdom. The kingdom of God is God taking all of his attributes and his traits and his qualities and his power and devoting it to the execution of a purpose. And he has chose to do this in the devil's territory. And he's going to tell angels and tell the devil and tell everybody else precisely what he's doing. And he's going to prove to you that he is the king. And that his kingdom is over all. And that no matter what comes against his purpose, it loses. So the kingdom of God, when it talks about the kingdom of God, it's talking about the revelation of who God is and what he's doing. When he's making it known. Now, there's two times of which the scripture in which the kingdom was depicted as being set up on the earth. One is Jacob's dream of the ladder. He saw a ladder set. The language is found in Genesis 28, 12. It was set up on the earth. I say the ladder was set up on the earth and it reached up into heaven. And there were angels ascending and descending on it. What was that? God was going to work out a purpose in the earth and it was going to be administered from heaven. It was going to be governed from heaven. God was going to make this purpose come to pass. Now the specific purpose in Jacob's day, God was going to develop a nation in the devil's territory. He was going to increase him in one of the devil's territorial places, Egypt, he was going to develop a nation for the purpose of raising his son. Now Jesus, he could never have been born in Rome. Never, this couldn't have happened. He had to be raised up and learn. He had to grow in wisdom and in stature and favor with God and man. And he had to be taught. That couldn't be in Alexandria, Egypt. So God raised up a special nation and he gave him a special land so that when Jesus was born, even though they hadn't been taking advantage of all the revelation, this young man, by the time he's 12, he's in the temple dialoguing with the doctors of the law. He could never have done that in any other city. This could not have been done. Now, don't think for one moment that Satan didn't try and stop this nation from being developed and stop this land from being occupied. But when Jesus entered into the world, the Jews were in the land, the prophets were written, the law was clearly, clearly specified, there were due teachers of the law, and Jesus, the Son of God, could be raised up. That was the work of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. Develop that city, that uh, country. Now Daniel, he also, he saw a, a kingdom set up on earth. 
And well, actually, it was given, a dream given to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar saw a gigantic statue that depicted four world kingdoms. They were, you know, today they say, we've got to watch out, folk. We're going to have a one world empire. Ooh, boy, that's scary. That's the only kind there was for the first few thousand years of the world. Come on. That's the only kind they had. World empires. Babylon, Medio Persia, Greece, Rome. Daniel saw this great statue and it's, he observed that it tended to deteriorate as it went down. It was gold on top and clay at the bottom. God said, in the days of these kings, I say, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And it shall break in pieces and consume all other kingdoms. And it'll fill the whole earth. None of those four kingdoms are around. And all the other kingdoms are going to be gone too. Amen. What does that mean? That was the beginning of the day of salvation. When God, would, his eternal purpose was to extract from a fallen planet and a fallen race, a group of people. Clean them up, regenerate them, and prepare them for glory. He was going to do it in the devil's territory. He was going to allow the devil limited access to them. But this process was going to be governed and administrated from heaven. He was setting up his kingdom. See, the difference in like Paul, he knew what God was doing. He knew the devil's going to lose. No chance that he won't lose. No chance at all. So divine resources are devoted, calling people, justifying people, sanctifying people, glorifying people, and that's a composite view of salvation. Salvation isn't just the forgiveness of sins. I'm sorry. No, I'm really not sorry, but it's not just the forgiveness of sins. It starts there. Salvation includes justification, complete exoneration of guilt. It includes sanctification, separation unto God. And it finally includes glorification. And, and salvation is not done till we're glorified. It's a work in process until then. Amen. And that's why we've got liabilities until then. Uh -huh. Until the work's done, nobody can quit. Amen. Or, is set up on earth. It's, this work is being done on earth. Yeah. He would commence with Jesus taking away the sin of the world. Jesus would destroy the devil by his death at his weakest point. He would plunder principalities and powers. He didn't annihilate them. He died to depower them because part of us being prepared, we got to wrestle against these. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Don't be going fussing and getting mad at people all the time. That's not who our enemies are. We're wrestling against principalities and powers that once dominated the world and held it captive. One of these principalities in Daniel's day, a great angel had to have help <laughs> to overcome this prince of uh, Persia. <laughs> had to be a great, powerful angel, and he couldn't do it, and Michael had to come and aid him. That's how potent. And as soon as this prince of Persia was overthrown, the prince of Greece, some spiritual power, came. These are the prince of Paris we're wrestling against. Amen. There's got to be one of these over the USA. Yes. There's got to be. But the, word, the church, professed church, is so weak and insipid, it can't even shut down a porn shop in Joplin, Missouri. Talk about powerless. Man, this is not, something's wrong here. We've got access to the throne of grace. We can come to it with all confidence. We're wrestling against these principalities and powers. We've been given armor to, to do it. Armor that's sufficient to quench every fiery dart they hurl at us something to protect our mind and our thinking processes. 
brazen breastplate to protect our vitals. See, we've got, the, we've got everything necessary to defeat this. And some folk, they can't get above going out and sweeping someone's yard. Now, this is nice. We're not against this. Let the little children do this. But we got bigger work to be doing. Let me t we got something bigger than that to be doing. We're part of a kingdom that can't be shaken. Amen. Now, Jesus is governing the kingdom from heaven. And he's doing a whole lot of things. Jesus is not just like sitting idly by. I'm going to mention a few things here. Now I'm going to tell you why I'm going to mention them. Salvation cannot be carried out unless there's a king administering it. There's got to be a king in heaven that's overall for any of us to safely negotiate from earth to glory. Amen. So he's reigning. The purpose of his reign is not to subdue enemies. Get this firm in your mind. Jesus is not reigning to subdue enemies. He can do that with the brightness of his glory and the breath of his mouth. All he'd have to do is look at all the principalities and powers and go, and that'd be it. God, even when Jesus was in the flesh in a weakened form, there wasn't a demon that ever attacked Jesus. There were demons made people blind, deaf, and dumb, throw them in the fire, throw them in the water, but none of them ever attacked Jesus or any of his disciples. In fact, they were scared of Jesus. Whoa, we know who you are. That's when he was in the flesh. What do you think it is now that he's in glory? He exalted higher than every name. Amen. Possessing all power in heaven and earth. Angels, authorities, principalities, and powers being made subject to him. Do you suppose there's any power of darkness that wouldn't fall down if Jesus looked at him? So he's not reigning. To get rid of the enemy. He's reigning to bring the sons home to glory through the enemy's territory. And he knows that by all logic rule, rules of human logic, they're not up to a task like that. But he's going to infuse them with power. Here's some things that he's doing as a king. It takes a king now to do this. Hebrews 2.10 says he's bringing many sons to glory. What a path. I've, I've already gone to myself, and there's people taking a lot rougher path than me. But he's already brought me some, through some stuff. Hey, I know how I got through it. It was a king. When the king said, let him by, devil had to step by. <laughs> Don't you know the devil's tried to take some of you out? I know, so I know some of the things of some of you. I know that some folk, that they, they marvel that you stayed alive. Heavens didn't marvel because you stay alive. Jesus said, oh, I'll let you touch him, but you can't take his life. Sometimes he says, I won't let you touch him. Who does it? A king. We're talking about a king. A king. We've got a king that's mediating the covenant. That's what he's doing right now. What does it mean to mediate the covenant? The new covenant is this. I'll put my laws in their hearts. I'll write them in their minds. I'll be to them a God, they'll be to me a people. They'll all know me from the least of them to the greatest. I'll be merciful to their unrighteousnesses and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now what Jesus is doing is mediating the covenant. He's making all that happen. He's the one that writes these things on your heart. So administer, he administers that as a king. He's a king that does this. He's interceding for those that are coming to God through him. He ever lives to make intercession. He is more difficult from one point of view. It's a lot more difficult to get you to heaven than to defeat all of Satan's hosts. This requires more divine power. And he's got it. He's using it for that purpose. So when you seek deliverance from evil, just remember that's number two. That's number two on the list. The Lord may deliver you from it. We don't deny this, but that's not the primary. 
work. He's building his church. He says, I'll build my church. <laughs> well, it looked like there are periods of history that looked like it wasn't going to get built. And right now, it doesn't look like it's been built too well. But he's a building it. There's a lot of scaffolding around it right now. I mentioned to you, I saw a skyscraper one time in New York that's being built. I don't know, was it 70 or 80 stories tall? It has scaffolding around it. That's all you saw was this wood scaffolding. Nobody really knew what that thing looked like. When they got through, they took the scaffolding away. It's like a glass building. It was, it was, it was remarkable. All right. That's what we got now. We got, a, we got a gem of a church being built, but there's scaffolding all around it. Amen. Flesh and blood and circumstance. Yep. <laughs> and it doesn't look like much now. Well, wait till you see the finished product. There's a king doing this building, see. He's bringing other sheep into his fold. He said to his Jews, he says, I have some other sheep, said to his disciples, I have some other sheep that are not of this fold. They don't go to our church. <laughs> I got to be careful here, you understand. But I got, thank God he does, have other sheep. I'd hate to think that the folk with which I was once identified, I'd hate to think that was the total number. My goodness, be downright embarrassing. He's bringing these sheep home. Some of listen, Pope, there there's some people sitting here tonight that just a few years ago you'd have never dreamed they were in the be ever be in the kingdom of God. You never would have dreamed they ever would have broken loose from Satan's hold. Here they are. What a king did that. It's a kingly activity. He's shepherding his flock. And he's a good shepherd. He's a great shepherd. <laughs> He's feeding his flock. Sometimes it looks like there's like not much food, but he gets it to them. He sends maybe some spiritual ravens to them. He's feeding his flock, shepherding his flock. He's the voice behind him that says, this is the way. Go ye in it. See, I'm establishing to you, brother, and you've got to have a king in place for this to be done. You've got to have someone who is over every other power or this simply can't be done. And he is, this is a man. Now this is a glorified man. Not even an angel could get this done. As powerful as angels are, they, they weren't equal to this. One angel could get Israel out of Egypt, but a multiplicity of them couldn't get saints into heaven. We gotta have more power than that and thank God we got it. He's the head of all principality and power. Every time Satan wants to do something, he has to say, Captain, may I? Is it okay if I test him? He'll say, well, go ahead, but I'm going to pray my, I'm going to pray that his faith won't fail. That night, that awful night when Peter denied Jesus three times. That was Satan tested him. He was under a very severe trial. Don't be picking around like as though he was a weak and vacillating man. He wasn't. Not Peter. He was under fierce attack. Now I'll show you how the king acts. The king just looked at him. And he recouped that night. And you never heard Peter deny Jesus again. Well, a king did that. Amen. A king administered that trial. He's ministering yours too. This king, he's able to keep the people from falling. This is stated in Jude 124. He's able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. God's able to do that. He's able to keep you from falling. If you feel like you're going to fall, we got a king. We're telling you we got a king. The king can keep you from falling. Maybe you got doubts. You think you're just going to topple. You can't hold out. You feel weak. The king will keep you. From falling. Romans 14 4 says God's able to make him stand. That was a weak, uninformed believer that just didn't know very much. God's probably made some of you stand to the King Jesus. See, it takes a king because there are adversarial foes against you that don't want you to stand. But when the king's there, he'll make you stand. That's the way he is. 
and he's bringing us to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, that he might bring us to God. <laughs> bring. Yeah, we said, maybe you envision being before God. You, maybe you, you're a little bit afraid of that. Afraid of thinking that some of your faults would be made known. I got some good news now for you. You stand there, you won't be standing there alone. The son looked to the father and say, he's with me. Amen. <laughs> that takes a king to do that. You got to be a king to do something like that. He can cause consolation to abound. You've experienced this, have you? You needed some consolation and you got a whole lot of consolation. You were ready to throw in the sponge and boy, you just got bold as a lion. What was that? It was a king sent this consolation through the prince of the power of the air through his domain. There was one angel that couldn't get through his domain for three weeks. A mighty angel couldn't penetrate Satan's domain for 21 days. But the king at the right hand, he can get consolation to you in a second. King does that. He's strengthening his people to do his will. It's what Colossians 1.11 says, strengthen with all might by his spirit and the inner man to do his will. You want to do God's will? You don't feel competent to do it? Jesus can cause you. He's a king. He's a king. He's a king over everything that's against you. It doesn't make any difference what it is. If it's against you, Jesus is over it. And it yields to Jesus. I said it yields to him. When Jesus says, back off, they back off. Remember that gathering demoniac? Chained him up, he broke the chains. <laughs> Jesus took a boat over there. The boat slid up on the shoreline. And in his humble state, he stepped out of the boat. And that man ran toward him. And he bowed down. He says, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. When that one's for you, who's going to be against you? You got to bank on that. See, I'm, teach I'm preaching this to you so you'll know you bank on, you bank on this king of the kingdom. You're a part of a kingdom and the king's administrating it. You've been translated into the kingdom of God's dear son and he's administrating this kingdom and it's, he's administrated so you'll get safely to the other side. Amen. He's preparing the church to reign with Jesus. If we suffer with him, we'll reign with him. So he's getting you ready. He selects what trials you go through. <laughs> and every temptation that comes he mandates that a way of escape accompany the temptation. See, it takes a king to do something like that. He's working everything together for your good. So Jesus has returned to heaven. He went, he went to heaven to get his kingdom. Daniel, Daniel 7, saw Jesus returning from earth in the clouds to heaven. Now on earth, they saw him go up in, in a cloud. Daniel saw him from the other side, and he, he arrived on the other side, and he said he took him to the ancient of days, and he was given a kingdom and dominion and power, and all nations and languages and tongues served him. He went to heaven to reign. He's not coming back to earth to reign. Amen. That's the good news of the kingdom. And it does sound good when you're a pilgrim and a stranger, when you just plain don't feel at home in the world. Amen. Maybe you've had this experience. I've, I've never been able to fit in with the cliques. I had the cliques in high school, I had the cliques in college, I had the cliques in Bible college, I had the cliques in church, you know, the cliques. I never, but I'm going to fit in. On the other side, the summation of what God is doing is found in Romans chapters 5 through 8. 
that gives you the details. He's justifying you, sanctifying you, going to glorify you. Now I'm going to close by asking you a question that Jesus asked Peter. He said, do you love me? Do you? Let's say it again. Do you love me? Do you? Or do you love me? Do you? If you can settle that question, I can guarantee that you'll end up safe on the other side. <laughs>